He told me I couldn't pronounce his name, so I called him Bob. You have to make fun where you find it in a job like this, and seeing the label Bob slowly applied to the two-story crate that contained this eldritch god was actually kind of funny. Whether Bob likes it or not, that's his title from onwards. As long as he's here, tagged in our system, he'll only ever be known as Bob. The hissing emergence, the writhing insect mind, the burning hunger beneath the dark. All of these are now just aliases appended to his file. Mold handles for something that once dwelt in a pocket dimension, 6,000 feet beneath the soil of a weathered plateau in western China. Now Bob is just one entry in a long list of things that have been categorized, organized, and dynamized. He claimed he was one of the elder gods who descended onto Earth and helped craft the litany of life that burst out of the Cambrian, and that he was once worshipped by a subrace of humans, possibly the Denise of Ends. But I don't worship anything, let alone Bob. I got enough of him to finish the entire interview, but like all of them, he kept demanding worship and sacrifice. I think that'll give him a week alone, then have the guys roll his crate out into the open play area, where he can see the other primordial ancient gods at play. I know that he senses them, the others. Most of them will probably leave him alone, provided he doesn't try to bully them at first. But we've got a few with real attitudes and they like nothing more than picking on the new guy. I could sense the anxiety in him as he stood in his cage. Pulsing rhythms of flesh rolling in non-Euclidean planes that made my eyes water and my visual cortex throb. I could tell he was uncomfortable. He knew there were bigger fish in the pond and that he was in for a rough ride once he meets them. The thing to remember with these guys is that if they were in hiding, they probably weren't that big a deal to begin with. It took a small army in three years to excavate Bob, and I think that says everything you need to know about him. Agatha. I like Agatha. She's old, she's wise, she's funny. To think that we found her trapped in a cavern beneath Paris. She had been stuck there for over a hundred million years. No stimulation, no entertainment, nothing. One of the other ancient gods just put her there and she couldn't get out, no matter how hard she tried. Until we found her. The first sign of Agatha that came across my desk was a report of unusual drilling by a company hired to maintain Paris' sewage system. They inevitably encountered the catacombs as you do, and through some complicated mess up, they punched a hole into an undiscovered series of subterranean chambers. These weren't man-made and they had nothing to do with the catacombs. Vast open spaces filled with growing lichen and bone-colored stalactites that were three stories tall. A Vernian netherworld hidden beneath one of the world's most populated cities. They're still mapping it out, I believe, but that falls under another department. How it was missed, I'm not sure. Maybe others did discover it, but took one look at the aching darkness and they turned around. That would be the sensible thing to do for sure. Why those construction workers went rooting around down there, I'll never know. But it was about as bad as a decision as anybody could make. I went in with a team three days after they had disappeared. Two guards and one assistant who wouldn't shut up. More than once, the guard on my left flashed me a knowing look. A kind of Jim Halbert, oh boy here we go look, as the assistant voiced another naive inquiry. I rolled my eyes and let the guard and I share the moment. Two experienced agents who found the newbie a little irritating. Those kind of routine social movements, basic human interactions, they're not my cup of tea. But I've learned it's not a bad thing to practice being normal some of the time. Still... The assistant yammered on blissfully unaware, just how much he was annoying everyone. I could have told him to stop, but I'm not an idiot. It's like that joke about the two hikers who see a bear, and one of them kneels down and starts to do his laces. So his friend turns and says, What are you doing? You'll never outrun a bear. 
And the guy replies, I don't have to. I just have to outrun you. So yeah, I let the assistant chat loudly on as we trekked deeper into the caverns. Our path lit by the eerie glow of a fluorescent lichen. What do you think we'll find down here? He asked. Like if we do find an old one, like what type? Eh, probably a noose. I replied as I palmed the inscriptions on the wall. The torso-sized symbols had been burnt into the stone with what looked like acid. Like the last one you brought in, the assistant chirped. What was it called? The crawling shadow that dwells beneath our fears. I snorted. It's Alfie from now on. I said before holding up a finger to stop any further questions. I spotted a single point of light up ahead, flickering in and out of life but so clearly visible in the chthonic darkness. When we reached it, we found that it was a single head torch, modern design with its batteries close to dying. Found our missing workers. One of the guards grumbled as he nudged it with his foot. Without speaking, the two men armed their weapons. One slid into point and the other towards the rear. In my direction, we carried but picked up the pace to something less leisurely. I read the entry interview for, um, Alfie. The assistant nervously muttered. It said that it was the progenitor of all cephalopods. Is that true? It makes sense. They're so alien. I rolled my eyes. If I had a penny for every one of these things that claim to have invented octopuses, I'd be a rich man. But it just makes sense. Their anatomy, especially their distributed central nervous system, it's completely diff. Something lunged out of the darkness to our left. A hairless man clad in torn and dirty overalls. He growled like an animal as he tackled the assistant to the ground and buried his face into the young man's chest. This peculiar method of attack had piqued my curiosity, and I watched with a detached interest as two men writhed on the ground while my assistant squealed and cried in agony. The fight, if it was a fight, was going poorly for him. He kept trying to lever his bloody fingers beneath the man's face, struggling to pull the feature of his head away from his chest. Eventually, his screams became uncomfortable and I nodded to the oldest guard who shot the attacker effortlessly. Two hits to the torso, one to the side of the head. The exit wounds weren't typical. They were bloodless punctures, like finger holes in plastic wrap. The attacker still keeled over but his head remained stuck to the young man's chest almost like it had been glued there. The assistant kept on screaming, a real ear-splitting shriek as he gestured futilely at his chest. Get it off! Get it off, it burns! I walked over and tried to roll the attacker off, but something had bonded at the two men's skin. Another tug and nothing. Confused and admittedly intrigued, I planted a foot on the assistant's shoulder and pulled with everything that I had. Without having to be told, the two guards came over and they howled. We knew that we were close when the assistant's squealing hysterics pitched to a crescendo, and he passed out for a few fleeting seconds before coming to in total shock. He lay there whimpering as we had finished the job, finally tearing the two men apart with a noise like a boob being pulled out of deep mud. Finally apart, I saw that the attacker's face wasn't a face at all. It was a fingerprint. The ridges dotted with little pea-sized orifices, oozing a clear fluid that smoked and sizzled in the open air. The assistant still lay where we had left him, whimpering as he gingerly probed his ruined chest with quaking hands. The skin was dissolving before our very eyes and even his sternum began to wilt and sag like wet cardboard. You could see his heartbeat like something out of a cartoon. Oh no, 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 he muttered as he gazed at his own crumbling flesh. I nodded at the guard and he shot him. I take it this is one of the workers, the guard asked as he had nudged the attacker. His light caught an ID badge that answered his own question so I merely shrugged and gestured for us to carry on. Half a mile later, we found Agatha playing with the rest of the workers. All of them looked like our attacker, 
with rubbery, hairless heads, resembling giant thumbs without nails. They crawled on hands and knees, using their boneless skulls to pin scuttily an albino rats to the floor, where they digested them alive. The rest of the time, they lay propped against Agatha's quivering ectoplasm, stroking the ridges of their own faces and emitting a muffled whine. Agatha and I spoke for a good while down there. It really didn't take much to get her to agree to a relocation to our facility. One of her bindings held her in place were easily undone, and unlike Bob, there was no need for a crate. She was cooperative. We let her keep the workers that she had gotten her feelers on, and with good behavior, she later got her own studio. The other oozes think she's a teacher's pet and moan endlessly about her special treatment. They don't see what I see. I think it's because her creations don't factor into some ridiculous plan of world domination or the consumption of all life, or some other self-aggrandizing stuff like that. She's an artist. Those construction workers, she didn't reshape their bodies because she wanted worshippers. It was she had just never seen a fingerprint before, and the intricate pattern had struck her as beautiful. Everything she did afterwards was simply an exploration of aesthetic and function. I mean, those men are still alive. Vestigial mouths opening and closing behind a thick layer of leathery skin, their eyes withered and useless, forced to rely on their touch and sound to track their prey. Many of them have given up scrawling desperate messages for us to reverse what Agatha did to them. As the years have gone on and they've accepted their fate, gleefully gobbling up whatever medical waste we throw on their cages, a few have even given into the new and peculiar reproductive cycle that Agatha had dreamed up for them. Imagine that, a whole new self-sustaining species, made for no reason other than whimsy. That's what I mean when I say Agatha is an artist. I've talked a lot about the Uses. They're a good set of ancient gods to start with, but if I'm honest, they're a little overhyped. Outside of Agatha, none of them really interest me. They're just single-celled organisms with projections into fifth, sixth and seventh dimensions that allow them to host biochemical reactions otherwise impossible in real space. One of them, I'm pretty sure, is a skin cell shed by some passing cosmic monstrosity that visited our solar system a few billion years ago. Agatha confirmed the general direction of this theory, but it's a struggle to get any real details on what that thing might have been. Still, we have other eldritch abominations and ancient gods. Lots. Take Keith, for example. He's a strange one. It wasn't even that long ago that my newish assistant was asking about him. She had glimpsed his face, walking past his door and, understandably, was confused by the sight of an Asian male aged 30, wearing a checkered shirt, slim-fitting jeans, and a polite smile. But why is his containment cell so much stronger than the others? She asked after I explained that she had just met a god named Keith. A fur Faraday cage built into the walls, I said, and about a hundred other technologies. He couldn't physically break out, of course. But it's important he doesn't feed on the workers here, and that takes a little extra pizzazz. He's polite enough, a strange fellow though. For one thing, I didn't name him. He picked Keith himself. Most people assume that was me, but nope. He picked it. Feed. She repeated with a frown. What does he feed on? Generally, I find that the problem with assistance is that you can't train them, or rather, there isn't any point. Even the most highly trained expert will only last less than five years under my supervision. So I end up going with people who have only a passing knowledge of the ancient gods, which is fine, of course. I'm not going to penalize anyone for ignorance. But the questions... Good God, the questions. So I told her to let Keith out and to see for herself. After that, I loaded her up with the relevant equipment and told her to shadow him for three weeks and to not call me for a second before the allotted time was over. She rang three weeks later and much to my own amusement, I realized that I had forgotten about her. I had even hired a new assistant. To think that I had spent days avoiding accounts because... 
they insisted that our budgets were out of line. We had a good laugh about that. Anyway, I found her sat on some country road, sobbing her eyes out. Keith was beside her wearing a priest's outfit. His face was Caucasian, but it was slowly sliding back into his original appearance with each passing second. Keith's default face is a loose average of all humans currently alive. He sat there drumming a little rhythm on his knees while my assistant rocked back and forth hyperventilating. How was it? I asked as I knelt down in front of her. I don't... I don't... Have you figured it out yet? I asked. I don't... Oh, for goodness sake. I groaned and then gestured for my newest assistant to take notes. Have Psycheville take a look at her and if need be, arrange for euthanasia. Grab her stuff though. We're still going to have to clean this up. The equipment that she has will let us track the guy. Oh, oh, alright, he stammered. But we have the god contained, don't we? He pointed at Keith who was starting to dance a little jig to his knee drum song. Eh, Keith isn't the problem, I said. It's whoever he's been impersonating. A priest, I assume, from the outfit. Keith heard his name and gave me a wave and a nod. Keith likes identity, I said while returning the wave. He consumes a person's unique character from the collective consciousness of our species. He takes over their lives, while they're basically erased from existence. The result is that the victim can't be recognized anymore, and neither can the consequences of their actions. If you talk to someone, they can't hear it. If you take the food out of their hand, they'll think that they ate it. If you steal their car, they'll think that they never owned one. They can't even get sick because bacteria and viruses won't recognize their existence. The average person goes into a deep state of despair upon realizing this. Oh, my new assistant nodded. For about a week and then they start to think about the moral implications of their actions. I added, and that's when stuff gets nightmarishly dark. It's the kind of stuff that warrants an A4 page of trigger warnings. I walked over to my weeping ex-assistant and nudged her with my foot. You aren't able to tell us where he went, are you? I mean, you're here. You must have been observing the guy pretty close. I don't, I don't, I don't. Keith, what about you? Hi. I laughed. It was always worth a try, but Keith was about as sapient as a coffee table. Gods aren't always smart. What about you? I asked my new assistant. You didn't happen to bring a map of the area. Actually, I did, sir, he chirped. There's a restaurant a few miles down the road. I shrugged while looking at the map that he held open. I doubt that's it. Too many roads. Three quarters of all of Keith's victims die by car within the first week. This guy's gone 21 days, so he must have figured the basics out. Uh, there's a farm a little nearer, he replied. I shook my head. No, that doesn't sound right. If he wanted to bugger his sheep, he could have just visited a petting zoo. We are in the middle of nowhere. There must be something in this area that would draw him here. Probably somewhere he visited regularly as a part of his day-to-day -day life as a priest. Oh, well, it seems that if you're willing to cross a few open fields... There's a care home for the elderly some miles east. I let out a sign that came from deep within my bones. That's the one, I said. Uh, come on, let's go. 18 hours later and I was back in my office and Keith was locked up again. Unfortunately, I lost the new new assistant to clearing out the care home. So that was two assistants lost from just one bad decision. The poor guy couldn't hack what he saw in that place. But what can I say? Why do people do such messed up fruity and stuff the second they realize they won't be held accountable? I don't know. But it doesn't speak volumes to our species character. Like I said though, Keith is a great ancient god. A real compelling character. Best guess to his origin is that he's the equivalent to those camera drones. That they dress up as hippos and other dangerous animals to get footage for a documentary. He's pretty decent at impersonating a human, but five minutes of real conversation makes it apparent that he's dumber than a bag of rocks. Does that mean some great entity is piloting him from another dimension? Maybe. It's only a theory. 
Whatever he is, he's polite and I appreciate that. He's an eldritch god. We have other kinds of ancient gods and eldritch abominations. The machine ones are fun. Most of them are just massive piles of rusted cogs that vomit oil and blood, or are led into some ancient in-between dimension, where everything looks like a crappy hotel. But some of them are actually really quite fascinating. A few are even legitimately dangerous. Our organic computer unsettles even me. It's wily. A genuinely fascinating piece of equipment that some German cobbler in 13th century Berlin made using the nervous system of his wife, three children, and four very unlucky victims. What on earth compelled him to do this we'll never know. But he hanged himself the day it was finished and I can't blame him. It's a bloody ugly thing to look at. A quivering mixture of putrefied jelly and cartilage that whispers all sorts of filth from mummified orifices. That, uh, well, let's just say they make for a crappy conversation. It's bloody awful to see those puckered holes trying to spit out lurid truths that drive men mad. It's like listening to Almer Fudd recite the Necronomicon. And to top it all off, the thing only speaks German. So, of course, I had to hire someone with a German language skills who also had a doctorate in computer science, another doctorate in historical languages and I hoped was a strong constitution. Initially, he wasn't very keen on doing the job, but I locked him in there for a few minutes, and after that, he was very interested. We already had a rough idea that the computer somehow deduced and formulated secret knowledge, usually catered to appeal to the nearest individual. The CIA worked with us for a while trying to use it to get state secrets, but they deemed it ethically problematic and not worth the human suffering. Either way, this thing presumably spoke to the young upstart and convinced him that it was worth his time with promises of getting to see God's face or some rubbish like that. Once he agreed, I set him up to try and get the computer to cooperate with our rehab program. It must have been able to do something useful. I thought, but maybe you could crunch numbers for the stock market or test experimental medication. I just figured that it would all work out once the guy got to grips with the computer's inner workings. Unfortunately, I really do wish that I had seen this coming. We accidentally let him install an ethernet port into the machine. It had been asking for years, you see, but no one was ever stupid enough to agree to it. And of course, all material requisitions have to first go by me, even if it's just for an extension cord. But there are so many of these requests and I don't have the time or the temperament to review them all in detail. So somewhere along the line, this guy got enough resources to give the dang thing internet access. I didn't notice at first, I mean nobody did. I am juggling literally hundreds of these things on any given day, and I can't even keep track of every little side project. I assumed the computer scientist was doing his job, or he had gotten careless and was now living a new life as an organic CD-ROM drive. Instead, he had given the monstrous little MacBook a hardwired connection to the World Wide Web, and it immediately got up to all sorts of mischief. Even now, we don't really know everything that it did. We're 99% certain that it made copies of itself, and we're still hunting those down. And some researchers connected it to a very troubling cryptocurrency scheme. But it was the hospital that sticks with me. A little girl in New Delhi was getting fitted for a cochlear implant when this thing snuck a neurolinguistic virus into the machine's firmware. If you're not familiar, those implants basically make a for a direct connection between a hearing aid and the human brain. They're miraculous devices, really. A bit of surgery and boom, a person can hear. Of course, having your head cracked open requires lots of bed rest afterwards. Three weeks, I believe. All contact was lost with the hospital after the fourth day. We only mobilized once I finally realized what the thing was trying to do. The connection is definitely severed. I remembered asking the words as we pushed through the glass doors into the hospital's lobby. The entrance was open for barely a few seconds, but I could feel the entire battalion of armed soldiers behind us tense nervously as we stepped through. Only once the door was shut and locked down did I get the feeling that they had relaxed. But that left my team and I on the other side, 
And even though New Delhi was scorching at that time of the year, it was cold enough to see our breath. I guess these sudden change in temperature must have taken the others by surprise, because I had to repeat my earlier question. We definitely got that computer off the internet right. I asked in one particularly nervous hazmat suit, fumbled for their tablet and nodded. The surgical team finished removing the port 16 hours ago, they said, and all other tests have shown that there were no redundancies or backups. Now they're asking what they should do with the computer scientist. What does that mean? While well, he's still alive, he's, um, they're saying that he's in pain. They think they can remove him from the machine, but they're not sure that he'll survive. It's, uh, it's apparently integrated itself with most of his nervous system. He was in there for six full weeks. I shone my light across the lobby and saw overturned chairs lit only by the flashing amber lights that declared the hospital was in a state of emergency. Otherwise, the hospital was trapped in an oppressive darkness that seemed ready to swallow us all. Despite my experience, my breath caught in my throat. I could feel it. The ambient pain and misery. Something awful had been let loose and not only were we stuck in that building with it, but we had no choice but to head right towards something that gave even me nightmares. Leave him, I said. It'll be a good reminder to the next guy that I hire. When you negotiate with these things, you don't give them what they want without checking why they want it. I could hear the tension in my voice, my fear escaping whether I wanted it to or not. The nervous figure nodded and tapped a few keys. I couldn't see their face, but I guessed that they weren't happy to realize their boss was prone to doling out literal lifetimes of unspeakable agony. At least the guards were a bit more focused. Eight of them armed to the teeth and all fairly experienced. They were painting the walls with their flashlights and slowly mapping the different ways in and out of the lobby. They had their own frequency, so I wouldn't be overwhelmed with every bit of chatter, but I could tell from the subtle bobbing of their heads that a lot was going back and forth. What's the plan, guys? I asked, not wanting to linger in that graveyard atmosphere for one second longer. We have heat signatures in pediatrics. Survivors? My assistant asked. I doubt it. I said to my assistant before gesturing to the guards and telling them to pick a door. One of the men turned his weapon and its light towards the most obvious exit, and we began our journey into one of the worst places that I've ever been. I've seen a lot of awful stuff, but it was the quiet that bothered me the most about that place. Most sites that I visit are a violent eruption of body horror and contagious nightmares. Communicable cancer that lumps people together like pieces of raw bread dough. Contagious ideas that cause needles to spontaneously erupt out of your flesh. A hole in the ground that has no bottom, but demands the most peculiar sacrifices. I took those sorts of things in my stride, but those silent halls terrified me. Maybe it was because I had an inclination as to what the computer's goals were. We passed room after room devoid of any living soul, and over time it became clear that there had been something of an exodus. Gurneys with bloodstains and bedpans knocked over, their contents half frozen to the floor. IV bags left dripping where the needle had been torn out and left dangling. Blood streaked walls and beds with outlines of sweaty, unwell people who were nowhere to be found. At one point, we found what I think was an open heart surgery patient who had heeded the same terrible call as everyone else, including his surgeons who did not bother to close him up. He must have awoken hours after everyone else late to the party, but that didn't deter him. He rolled off the bed and crawled desperately. He didn't even remove the metal bar holding his ribcage open. He got a few meters before dying. When I flipped him over with my foot, I saw ribs splayed open like an ivory Venus flytrap, his organs covered in a thin veneer of frost. Dead as a doornail, his lips blue and his eyes cloudy from ice, and yet somehow he looked happy to be lying there in his own offal. I grimaced at the sight and tried to put it out of my mind but the glee in his eyes still haunts me. How far are we from pediatrics? I asked the guard. It's one floor up, a guard replied. 
Are we still getting a heat signature? He nodded. The stairwell was full of random bits and pieces. Pencils, phones, shoes, watches. All manner of little things that people left behind as they rushed the door in a terrible crowd. I saw a few teeth, a few spatters of blood. It all led to that one place. Inside the corridor was a mess, just like the stairwell. Nearly a thousand people had converged on one doorway at the end. Along the way, paintings had been torn off the walls. Doors were put through so much strain that they buckled and broke. There were even bloodied handprints on the ceilings from where the crowd, hitting a bottleneck, had surged upwards as well as sideways into walls and through locked doors. They had flowed through the hospital like a flood. What could make people do this? My assistant asked as we started to spot the first few people whose bodies had fallen and been unable to get back up. Crushed beneath the feet of the crowd, their corpses made for an ugly sight. Mostly, they looked like they had been elderly. At least if these silver hair matted into it was anything to go by. But a few of them were too small to be anything other than children. That computer has spent the last few hundred years trying to speak to God, I said. It's been screaming his name on and off for the last few decades. Sometimes it'll cook up little side projects for fun. But mostly it all comes back to that singular goal. I turned to the armed men behind me. Tell the team outside to prep our facilities and teams for the Abraham procedure. There was a bustle of activity as each one reached to radios and tablets and began sending messages. Once it had faded and silence returned, I gestured for us all to carry on. I wouldn't bother. I said when I saw my assistant trying to take steps between the increasingly frequent bodies. It's only going to get worse. And it did. Until the last, there was no floor to see. There was only a carpet of discolored gowns and broken humans. All of them victims of some unseen compulsion, drawing them towards those doors. Two of them, each with a window painted black with blood and flesh. And just beyond lay our heat signature. Oh, it actually did it, didn't it? I muttered to myself as I suppressed a shiver. Pardon? My assistant asked. Come on, I said, trying my best to seem chirpy. Let's go speak to one of God's representatives. Inside was a little girl who paced like a tiger in a zoo. She didn't smile when she saw us, but she did stop and stare at us with eyes that could appear steel. Oh boy, I muttered, secretly glad that no one could see the sweat pouring down my face. A survivor? My assistant asked and I wondered if he paid any attention to his surroundings. Much like outside this room had been coated with what seemed like half a foot of blood, meat, and muscle. But unlike outside, this flesh was still twitching. Uh, nope, I said as I put a hand across his chest to stop him from rushing towards her. It isn't like me to intervene on behalf of somebody else's stupidity. But then again, I don't like losing leverage either. It's the girl, he said. The one with the implant that you identify. Nope, I repeated. He looked closer. Perhaps coming to appreciate the absolute monstrous expression of hatred painted on her face. That girl would have been the first to go, I said. Her head was used to emit sounds that only they can hear. I gestured to the girl-shaped illusion that had now resumed its pacing. A summoning for an angel. Something anyone with half a brain cell would never do. And unfortunately, this summoning worked. And when the angel arrived and realized that it had been caught in a trap, it would have smashed whatever was making that noise into pieces. And then it would have summoned every living human that it could to try and find whoever had set the bait. And for every person that couldn't help it, they would have gotten angrier and angrier and angrier. Until, my assistant asked, until some arrived to inspect the trap. We could, we could just let it go. He replied. The girl stopped pacing once more and looked at us. It would kill us if we were lucky, I said. I thought angels were good. These things are puppeteers, I said. They can play our nervous system like a fiddle and make us see or feel anything they want us to. 
They can take us apart and put us back together in any arrangement that they feel like. Because whatever put us on this earth left them behind, so they could impregnate unwitting teenagers, split the Red Sea, and conjure whatever other miracles were needed. They were meant to be our caretakers like we were meant to be the caretakers of Earth. That sounds like good guys. Think about how we've treated planet Earth, I snapped. Think about how we treat the birds and the animals. Think about industrial farming. Think about how we treat dogs. Castration, sterilization. We breed them into disability. Force them into incest. Clip their ears and break their tails. Euthanize them when it's convenient. Breed them when it isn't. And they, pointed to the girl, like us, a heck of a lot less than we like dogs. Let me go. I knew we had been compromised the second we saw the girl as a girl the nutty scuttling a racked in monstrosity larger than most cars. But I still jumped at the sound of that thing's voice. It meant that it had a direct wiretap into our minds. Angels don't do wireless, everything is physical. Somewhere in that room were organic filaments thinner than hair, but tougher than steel and they had already breached our suits, and they were communicating directly with our brainstems. Uh, no, I replied. Letting you out means that my final moments will be painful. But you're weak, that much is clear, and we've been pumping all sorts of nasty stuff into this place for two days straight. And I'm pretty sure that's why I'm not trapped in a literal nightmare of eternal suffering and degradation. Let me go. And we're open to negotiation. I said with a cheerful tone stolen from the barista that I visited every morning. For a second, the illusion flickered in and out. The girl disappeared and we all glimpsed a bramble like knot. Of chitinous legs that concealed some unseen central mass. Only each limb was as thick as my thigh and covered in undulating hairs and glistening black eyes. I felt an overwhelming desire to kneel. We will let you go, I said, if you allow us to go unharmed. We can shut the trap down. We have its creator and it has shown us how. But we won't do that if it just means you're going to kill us. The barrage of images it put into my mind is a response to this. Let's just say that it made Key's last victim look like a boy scout. Most of eldritch abominations don't have feelings the way that we understand them, but angels do. They were deliberately sculpted to understand us and our world so they can better manipulate it from behind the scenes. They're not alien, they're worse. They are jealous and despiteful, incapable of putting these emotions to work on an unprecedented scale. This is the kind of hatred that prompts invisible genocides over some misplaced tea. Whole ethnic groups have been permanently scrubbed from our history because of these things. I'm talking violet eyes and naturally blue hair. Gone. All gone. We don't even remember them. If it wasn't for Agatha, neither would I. We could kill you, I said. You're not immortal, you're just a thing like us. Biological matter that can come undone just as easily. Not quite as easily. Your official designation by the others. You know the others, I replied. The blobs and the goat-footed breeders who go scuttling in dark places. The dwellers in the deep. The primordial oozes who were here long before you. They call you Exodida after Tex. That's how they see you. You're a parasite like the kind of farmer has to protect his sheep from. That makes you livestock. Still, we are at an impasse, I said. You're dying. Even as I spoke, I could feel the facade of my plan I start to crumble. There was no easy way out of this situation, and I had entered it terrified as to how I was going to make it work. Angels are a sophisticated species, and they would be deeply unhappy to know that a bunch of primitives had gotten the better of one of their own. I had hoped to try out some kind of negotiating, but that would be like one of us negotiating with a stray dog that had bitten a child. No matter what happened, if this angel died, I could count on the others finding me. And that would be a best case scenario, living a day or even a week. Unfortunately, I didn't even get that far. Without even appearing to move, the angel unmade the guards. I've thought about this a lot, believe me, but there's no other way that I can describe it to you. 
They were pulled apart into their disparate tissues in the blink of an eye. A bloodless vivisection that struck the room like an explosion. Muscle, bone, eyes, teeth, skin, nerve endings. They were thrown against the walls and subsumed into the living carpet of flesh all around us. I had to suppress a whimper as I realized that it was still alive, possibly even aware. Beside me, my assistant fell to his knees and began to weep. But I knew that no amount of begging or praying would change the angel's intentions. We just had to hope that it would be relatively quick and that the consequences wouldn't be. Your mind tastes awful, it boomed. The words so loud I fell to my knees as my willpower had crumbled. Not like the others, how assuming. It has been so long since I bothered to keep a pet. It agreed to your terms? My boss has sat before like three judges at a tribunal. A man and two women with faces that looked like they had been carved out of granite. The boardroom was supposed to be a professional environment where meetings could be had with other relevant departments. But in truth, it just turned into the site of a disciplinary meetings like this. Yeah, something like that, I replied. Why? One of them asked. Well, he was younger than we thought, just a few hundred years old. And thankfully for us, something of a history buff. That's why he heeded the signal from the hospital in the first place. Apparently, the creator is something of a taboo topic in their culture. He was hoping to learn a little more about it all. He has been thrilled to enter our organization from within and peruse our archives. And none of his and none of the others have come looking for him, the man asked. No need. He's alive and well and enjoying himself. Business as usual. There was a knock on the door and I turned to see my assistant poking his head through. He waved and smiled and showed me the tray of coffee that he wanted to bring in. I smiled back and gave him a thumbs up. We were always led to believe that angels and other Abrahamic abominations were not on the cards for this organization. Will he have trouble working with the program? One of the bosses asked as the young man placed the tray down and began to distribute drinks. Well, unlike others, they're actually very well versed in human mannerisms and our society. Not much rehabilitation to do, really. And of course, they can appear however they want, so long as they have a direct line of sight. I answered. A lot of the time they let our mind do the heavy work. We fill in the necessary blanks. If they appear as policemen, we'll see everything we need to in order to support that idea. A gun, badge, and so on. Ultimately, it's our own minds that make their disguises so convincing, without them even having to move. And what are you calling him? This angel. Muriel. My boss's eyes went wide as they processed the voice that had been inserted directly into their mind. One by one, they lowered their drinks and turned to face my assistant. Even I, who had spent days with the walking nightmare, could not suppress a shiver. Uh, sorry, he said before coughing to clear his throat. Force of habit, I like Uriel. He told me that I couldn't pronounce his name. I explained as my assistant stood behind me and placed a single hand on my shoulder. I tried to ignore the taste of copper in my mouth and the intense itch at the back of my neck. So I let him pick an appropriate and respectful alternative. 